As you're grabbing your seats, I want to take just a second to say thank you to Pastor Brian for leading our students this weekend. Um, if you've ever gone on one of those retreats before as a volunteer or ever led one, you know that there's a lot of work that goes into that, and um, it can be a very exhausting experience, but it can also be very fulfilling uh, in the spiritual sense, and so that's been my prayer for uh, he and, and Jack, who led the students this weekend, that God would fill them uh, with that spirit filled energy uh, that they needed. And listen, uh, God was faithful to answer our prayers this weekend. Uh, we had two students uh, that trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And yeah, hey, listen, that's something you better clap for, for real. Like, clap like the Chiefs just scored a touchdown or something, all right? Because we're, we're talking about Ephesians, right? And we talked about in chapter 2, that we who were once dead in our trespasses and sins have been now made alive in Christ Jesus. And so that's what those two young people experienced this weekend was life in Christ. And so that is certainly worth celebrating. But, but thank you, Pastor Brown, for leading that group. Um, incredible group of students. I think we had 31, 32, something like that students um, on the retreat Shows you what God has been doing in our student ministry. And maybe even more significant than that, we had eight adult volunteers. Um, so uh, pray uh, for them. Uh, many of them have stuff later this week, too. And so, so pray for them that God use this as a, as a spiritual recharging. But thank you for, for leading that uh, group well. So parents in the room, if you're ever like, are these things worth sending our students to? Are they significant in the spiritual development of my teenager? The answer is yes. All right, so I, I totally get it, but do everything in your power to get students on these uh, trips. I was saved on a mission trip with student ministry. I accepted a call to ministry at church camp, and I know that many of you in this room probably have a similar story. So anyways, um, yes, send them on those things, and thank you, Pastor Brian, for, for your hard work this weekend. All right, so Ephesians. Get your Bibles and open them to Ephesians chapter 4. This is where we begin to make a transition in the book, okay? Remember the very first week we talked about the fact that the first three chapters of the book were building um, upon doctrinal foundation, right? So Paul starts... Um, in the um, indicative mood, which just simply means that he's telling us true things, right? So he's trying to help us build that doctrinal foundation. This is who you are in Christ. This is all that Christ has done on your behalf. So he spends three chapters, exactly half of the book, expounding upon that. And then we get to chapter four, and we see that he switches to the imperative mood, which is him telling us what we're to now do as a result of the truth that we found in the first three chapters. So it's fascinating. There's 41 imperatives in the book of Ephesians, and only one was in chapters one, two, and three. So from this point on, we've got 40 different imperatives that we're going to take a look at. Not all this morning, so take a big uh, deep breath. In fact, I started this week on Monday. My goal was to cover ch chapter 4, verse 1 through verse 16, and we're going to go to verse 3 today, all right? And so... Um, you can thank Aaron for that. Um, I got with her on Monday, and I was like, I feel like this is where the Lord's leading. Like, here, here's what I've got so far. And she's like, uh, that's three sermons at least. And so uh, that's what it turned into. It turned into three sermons. So we're going to spend time together this morning looking at the first three verses. But again, the, the significance here is that the mood changes in Paul's writing style. So now that we have a good understanding of all that Christ has done Here's how we're supposed to live. This is what we're supposed to do about it, okay? And this is, this is good for us that we've built this on this doctrinal understanding, all right? So this week in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we're going to look at the subject of Christ-like conduct, okay? So Paul starts right out of the gate in these first three verses with, because of all of that, here's what should be true about the way that you live your life as a believer in Jesus Christ. And so that's where we're headed. Read with me. First three verses of chapter four, then we'll pray, and then we'll spend some time unpacking what all this means today. So starting in verse one, Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you 
God, for your word. We thank you for all that uh, it, it means to us, God. We thank you for the instruction that we now find in it. But God, we are very grateful that we've been able to spend uh, the last several weeks, God, understanding more about you, understanding more about what you've done on our behalf, God, and understanding more about ourselves as a result of, of who you are and what you've done. So God, I pray this morning, now that we jump into these three verses, God, that we would understand what you're calling us to do God, that, that this isn't a way to pay you back for all the things you've done, but God, we in Christ have now been made free for good deeds. God, that, that we have now have the opportunity to walk and live a lifestyle of Christ-like conduct because of the calling to which you've called us. And so God, I pray that this morning that you would help illuminate that for us in the scriptures. God, I pray that you would bring us to a place of understanding. God, I pray that, that you would uh, convict if, if conviction is necessary, God, just like you've done in my life this week in the study of this, God, I pray that you would shine bright lights on our heart, God. If there's any dark places in there, God, I pray that you'd root them out this morning. And God, that you'd help us to be able to, to see whether or not we're actually living a life of Christ-like conduct. Or God, if we're just pretenders. And so, Lord, I pray that you would do the work through the Spirit this morning, God, to show us what we need to see, and God, give us boldness to respond how we need to respond, and we pray this in Christ's name, amen. All right, so Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, like I said, we're going to take a little bit of time going through this uh, one really phrase at a time here in the first couple of, of sentences here. So we see in verse one that Paul starts with, therefore. Now remember what we talked about last week. What should that word uh, help you understand? That you should go back before it, right? So anytime you're studying God's word and you come across a therefore, it's trying to emphasize something that came before it. And in this sense, it's, it's all three chapters that came before where we're at right now. So Paul is saying like, because of, of all this doctrinal foundation, that we've been discussing over the last several weeks. This is what I want to now challenge you with, okay? So Paul said, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord. Now, we know that there's a physical component to this because Paul is in chains. He's in prison as he writes the book of Ephesians. This is a prison epistle. But I believe that there's an element of, of, of spiritual service to the Lord that Paul's talking about here. We see this all throughout the rest of his writings. In fact, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says that I've been crucified with Christ, right? I no longer live. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul sees himself as a servant under the Lord. He's saying, I'm a, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. I'm in his service no matter where I find myself. So if that's in chains, then I serve him there in chains. And so he's telling these, these believers in, in Ephesus that he wants to urge them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which they've been called. So there's several words here that I want us to look at for a second. Urge. Let's start with the word urge. So, so this is, uh, in, in our minds, uh, we think of words like beg, like he, he's imploring, right? And it's stronger in the Greek than it even is in the English language. We don't have a good word for this. So to, it, it's even more than beg. He, he, he's, he's imploring them. He's urging them to walk in this manner worthy of the calling. And then he says, uh, he uses the word walk. Right, and, and we understand from Scripture, Paul, Paul talks about this a lot. In fact, uh, over eight times in this book, he's going to use the word walk. All right, And he's not talking about how you physically walk around. Right, like He wants you to think of the word lifestyle. So when you see walk, I want you to think lifestyle. Like this is, this is how my life is defined, right? Like, so he's saying he wants you to walk in a manner worthy. So live a lifestyle worthy of the calling. And we saw that the word walk in chapter 2. So flip over in chapter 2 real fast. This is important for us to understand. In chapter 2, starting in verse 1, he said, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Right? So he said, before you came to saving faith in Christ, your lifestyle, your lifestyle was, was determined by your spiritual deadness. Right? And, and so that, that's what you did. Like you, you lived a sinful, spiritually dead lifestyle. That was, that was how you lived. Now in chapter 4, because of all that Christ has done for you, the challenge is now to walk or live a lifestyle worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Now we need to do something with this word calling here. So what, what were we called to? What, what does that mean, calling here? Well, we see that this calling 
uh, came to us in chapter 2 as well, and it's a call from death to life, right? That, that you've been brought out of spiritual darkness, that you've been brought out of spiritual deadness, and you've been made alive in Christ Jesus. This is the calling to which you've been called. It's, it's the picture of Jesus and Lazarus, right? That's the picture for us. Like The Bible tells us that Lazarus dies. He's in the tomb for four days, right? And I love the, the, the King James version of that. It said, he stinketh, right? So he's been dead a while, He's dead, dead, as dead as you can get. And the Bible says that Jesus doesn't even go in to the temple. What's it say? He says he calls Lazarus out. And so this is the calling to which you've been called. It's, it's life in Christ. All right? So that's what he said. You should live a lifestyle worthy of the calling or your salvation that you have in Jesus Christ. And by the way, this is not you being a little different than you used to be right? This is you being brand new, spiritually reborn, completely transformed. We see this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. Paul writes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And that's going to be significant because of what we're about to talk about. Listen, Apart from new life in Christ, apart from being born again, you cannot live the life that Paul's going to call you to live. It's impossible. You might be able to do it for a little while, but you're going to fail. Why? Because, because you're doing it in your own power. You're still dead in your trespasses and sins according to Scripture. You're, you're not brand new. You've not been transformed so for some of you in the room, if you're trying to figure out, like, like, why have I always struggled with this? Or why is it not working? It's not that God, his power is lacking. The, the real truth, and I say that with, with a, all love and compassion, the real truth may be that you are not a part of Christ. It may be that, that you've latched on to some things that the Bible teaches, and, and, and you, you thought that those were good moral things to seek after, but yet you find yourself never being able to live them out. Why? Because you're trying to do something that's impossible for you to do. Dead people who are in spiritual darkness can't live out what Paul's calling us to, to live out here. But those of us in Christ who've been called into this great calling, we can live in a manner worthy of that calling. Remember, that, that lifestyle, that Christ-like conduct. Now, last word I want to deal with here in verse 1 is the word worthy. It, it, it's fascinating to me. This week, as I was doing word study on this, it's, it's the picture of scales, all right? It, it, it's equal balance. Paul's saying, like, listen, your, what you understand and what you know about Christ should be in balance with how you conduct your life. Like, they, 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 they should go together, right? Like, what do we call somebody who believes something, but it's not in balance with what they actually live out? What do we call that person? A hypocrite, right? And that's absolutely true. That's what we gotta be careful of here is Paul's saying, listen, don't, don't walk in a manner that's hypocritical, to the calling to which you've been called. If you say you believe these things, to walk worthy in that manner is to walk in balance, is to actually live and do what you say you believe. It's a powerful picture for us of that. In a lost and dying world, listen, they're, they're quick to call Christians hypocrites. And so part of that answer is you're absolutely right. I am a hypocrite because I can't do all this on my own. I can only live this life out through the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work within me, right? But don't be guilty of, of living up to the name in, in the fullest extent, right? Because I think primarily what the world is saying is, listen, there's a lot of Christians, I'm using air quotes here, there's a lot of Christians out there who don't look like Christians, they don't live like Christians. They don't talk like Christians. They don't act like Christians. There's nothing about your life that would cause you to be found guilty of being a believer in Jesus Christ. And that's the one that Paul's warning against here. If, if you're full on in that hypocritical lifestyle, like, like, like you're two people, which by the way was my story at one point, right? Like I knew enough about the, the gospel and about the word to play a strong Christian game, right? Right? I could show up to church and I could say the right things. I could do the right things. 
But then on the inside, I was full of dead men's bones. Because I wasn't spiritually alive. I was an imposter. I was a hypocrite. I was playing a part, right? I remember one of the things that shook me or really stood out to me the most when I was a teenager is right after I'd come to Saving Faith in Christ, I began to work at Dylan's, the grocery store. I was uh, started with the awesome opportunity to go get all the carts um, and then slowly worked my way up to being able to be a cashier. I don't know if that was a promotion or not. I don't know. Um, but what I began to notice was a lot of people from our church would shop at the Dillons that I worked at. And what I began to notice was the people that I saw at church were very different from the people that I saw and experienced at Dillons. Right? And one of them in particular stood out to me because one of them was a pastor at our church. And listen, he, he's He's one of those guys at church, man, like he's holding the door, he's smiling, he's greeting everybody. How are you, brother? Saying all those church things, right? Like he's a professional churchman. But I got to see a side of him that I don't think that he even knew I saw because I, I don't know if he even recognized me as much as I recognized him. But, but what I got to see was a, a person that did not live out Christ-like conduct in the, in the community, I mean, this guy was notorious within the, the Dillons that I worked at for just being a jerk. I mean, he would shred these, these cashiers all the time over something. I mean, something as silly as like, you know, that ham rang up $13.99 and that sign said $11.99 and like he would just let you have it, right? And I remember thinking like, like what, what's going on here? Like how can you, how can you say that you're a believer and, and then live a lifestyle outside of the walls of the, the building, right, that, that doesn't look like that. And what he was doing was he was living a hypocritical lifestyle. It was not conduct worthy of the calling to which he had been called. I mean, that's a challenge for all of us, including myself this week. It was like my, my, my interactions with everybody, like how do they go? And God has done some convicting work on my life this week, right? And I, and I pray that he does the same for you. But listen, this isn't some encounters. This is all of our encounters, all of our interactions with people. Every word that comes out of our mouth, every thought that goes through our mind, every deed that we do, like are we, are we living with Christ-like conduct in all of those areas of our lives? And listen, it matters. It does matter. Because it's not living worthy of the calling if we're not doing it, if we're not putting it into practice. Like I said in my prayer, listen, this isn't about us doing some workspace thing to, to earn back our salvation from God. No, this is us understanding that because we're new creatures and we've been made spiritually alive, we can now live with Christ-like conduct. So we should do that. Like I said, it, it matters a great deal. And this is what Paul's challenging us with. Listen, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So then in verse 2, we get to what he's actually talking about. So, so like, give us, give us the things, Paul. And, and this is what I love. You'll notice, we, we saw this in the book of Philippians. Paul's kind of notorious for this. He doesn't actually give you a specific list of all the do's and don'ts. What he does is he supplies for you a type of person, right? He wants to describe for you a type. And he's gonna give us five things in these two verses that I think he'd say, like, if you live these out, if you, if you walk in these things, if you would be known for these things, then you would be walking with Christ-like conduct. And if you're not, well, then... The Lord needs to do some work in your heart, right? There's some adjustments that need to be made. And so let's start verse two with where he heads. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So the first thing we see there that he lists out is that we're called to walk in humility. Walk in humility, and we're going to go back to Philippians for just a second because I think it gives us the best 
explanation of what Christ-like humility looks like. So just as a refresher for us, we can never hear this enough, I promise you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul writes, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Man, what a challenging passage of Scripture there. Count others as more significant than ourselves. That's an unbelievably hard challenge, right? It's easy to understand, hard to put into practice. We talk about that all the time. But that's what genuine Christ-like humility looks like. And when Paul's writing this in the first century, humility is looked down upon. In, In fact, it's not even fair to say first century because even today, this kind of humility is still looked down upon, right? Like to consider others as more significant than yourself is not the mantra of a lost and dying world, right? In fact, the world, apart from Christ, is saying, listen, you do you. You do it to the fullest, right? Others more significant than you? Who could possibly be more significant than you? And Paul's saying here, if, if we're believers, the first, the first thing that we need to do if we're to live with Christ-like conduct is to walk in humility, counting others as more significant than ourselves, looking out for their interest above our own. Listen, back to the Dylan's thing I was talking about. Like, like to live that out, listen, if, if you just go about your daily life walking in Christ-like humility, thinking of others first, thinking of others as more significant than yourself, thinking how, how you could serve and love them, you know what it will guard you against? It will guard you against self-centeredness that leads to you walking in a way that's unbecoming of a believer in Jesus Christ. So that when the, when the girl behind the cash register rings up your ham and it's $2 more than the sign in the back says it was, you don't lose your gospel witness. Why? Because... I'm considering her more significant than myself in this scenario. I'm living and walking in Christ-like humility. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. And it's certainly not worth losing that gospel witness over. So guard against self-centeredness and walk in Christ-like humility, right? Number two, he says walk in gentleness, In gentleness, this is the idea of self-control, right? That you're not controlled or ruled by aggression or retaliation. Some of your translations may say meekness. Listen, don't confuse that with weakness, right? When we say gentleness and meekness, we're we're not describing for you somebody who's just so passive that they just get trampled on by everyone in every situation. That's not what Paul's talking about here. But Paul is talking about you walking with gentleness and self-control, understanding when it's appropriate to respond with righteous indignation and when it's not, right? Our, our greatest example of this in Scripture is Jesus himself. He was, he was power under control, right? God himself. When you think about that, that's what it looks like to walk in gentleness. And we got two pictures of Jesus in the New Testament, right? One is Jesus standing silent before his accusers while people mock him and belittle him. And the Bible actually even says one of them goes so far as to slap him in the face because of how he's speaking to the high priest. And the scriptures say that he does Nothing in retaliation of that. But we have another story in Scripture that we see in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 13, where Jesus enters into the temple and the money changers have taken it over and it's no longer about spiritual things, the things that it was supposed to be about, but it was about these carnal things. And that same Jesus who stood silent before his accusers on his way to the cross is filled with righteous anger and begins to throw all the tables over of all the money changers, right? And, and, and the Bible would say that that is your greatest picture of what it means to walk in gentleness. It's you 
understanding when to be angry and when not to be angry. It's being angry at the right times and never angry or filled with retaliation at the wrong times. And that's why I think Paul describes it like a type, right? He's saying, listen, I can't give you all the interactions that you're going to have with people, but I promise you this, you're going to have interactions with people, and it's better to be general so that you know how to operate within those conflicts and those interactions than it is to be specific. But we're reminded to walk in gentleness, that we not be aggressive in in how we approach people. Listen, our culture is bad at this, and we're sucked into it with them, right? Like literally like Twitter exists really for people to just take pop shots at each other. Most of all your social media has become that. It's full of aggression and retaliation and opinions that nobody cares about. It's not helping us as believers. And Paul's saying like, listen, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you're called to walk in gentleness. You're to walk in a counter-cultural kind of way. When everybody around you is doing this, like you should stand out because of your gentleness. So that's the question for you. Are you marked by your gentleness? Or have you been marked by your aggression? And that's both outright and passive, by the way. Some of us, you're like, man, listen, I've never seen that people, that, that person lose their temper before. But listen, sometimes, sometimes the, the worst kind of aggression is the passive kind of aggression, right? And you may not have any loud outbursts. You may not be like me. I'm loud all the time. You may be very quiet, but you still may be in sin. Just because you're not loud doesn't mean that you're not falling into this pattern. Are you gentle in your interactions with folks and how you you go about your life? Are you aggressive? The next thing he gets to is patience. And my goodness, this one isn't any easier, right? We, we've talked about this a lot. You guys know it's, it's like what God has to work on me with every single day. I'm, I'm sure you're the same. Patience, like waiting without immediate results. That's the definition for patience, waiting without immediate results. So he's saying, listen, to, to live your life in Christ-like conduct is to live it with patience. And listen, believer in Jesus, you were never, ever promised that things were gonna go perfectly good for you. You're gonna get opportunities to live this out. Christ-like patience. You talk about countercultural. I mean, to be able to operate this with things that are going on in our lives, right? Difficult things, hard things. Maybe some of you are going through a medical thing. And like, listen, we all want to pray, God, just take it away now. And my prayer for you is that you do find health and, and healing in all that. But listen, like, this is difficult for us because God operates on our hearts through this. We want it now. Like we're, we're getting to the point now where like we're, we're frustrated at how long the microwave's taken. Like my goodness, that thing took three minutes to cook? Are you kidding me? I've got 5,000 screaming kids. We need mac and cheese now, right? But it's waiting without immediate results. And, and one of the things that can really get us tripped up here and, and grow a, a root of bitterness in, in our hearts, not only towards those around us, but also towards God, is unmet expectations, right? And by that, I'm, I'm talking about this patience thing, like waiting without immediate results. Listen, do not hold God accountable for things that God did not promise you. but walk in patience. Every single experience and interaction you have marked with patience. The next thing he talks about is walking in love, and he actually writes it this way. He says, bearing with one another in love. So what does it look like to walk in love? I I love that he adds the bearing with 
one another. Because what Paul is describing is a type of love that's unconditional, right? An unconditional type of love. Like it's the type of love that you're called to love your spouse with. It's the type of love that you're called to, to love your children with, right? And, and now he's applying it to us as individuals with those that are around us outside of those spheres, right? Including the body of believers, the church. And he's saying, listen, you're to walk in love, but you're to walk in an unconditional kind of love, bearing with one another, right? That you would exercise restraint and tolerate differences, the church is bad at this. The church is no different than the world on this most of the time, honestly. We show up, and how many people's story is this? Like, you just, you're just you looking for that great church, and you finally find one, and then six months later, that lady, like, said that thing. You know what I'm talking about? You just got under your skin. Now it's time to look for a new church. Or that guy did that thing, or that pastor. I mean, he didn't say hi to, or whatever it is. You're not bearing with one another. Unconditional love requires you to know that you're gonna experience conflict and it requires of you a willingness to lean into that. And I know that's not easy. It's not even easy with your immediate family, right? Like, listen, I'll be the first to tell you, oh, my parents aren't watching this, but we were like masters at sweeping stuff under the rug. If we, don't, if we just stop talking about it, then it probably didn't happen, right? That's how we address conflict, because conflict is hard. But what Paul's saying is, listen, you should love one another in such a way that you're willing to bear with one another, that you're able to exercise restraint and tolerate differences, that you don't give up on each other. That you do the hard work to be able to continue on with one another. Why? Because there's something way more significant going on than whatever it is that's making you upset. And that's the mission that Christ has given us as the church. I can lay down all this stuff, bear with one another, walk in love, exercise restraint, tolerate differences. Next one. Last, but certainly not least, the number, number five thing on here, Paul says walk in unity. And this kind of, kind of goes along with what we just talked about with bearing with one another, right? They kind of build upon each other, but to walk in unity, this is, what, this is what's interesting about this. He says in verse three, eager to maintain the unity. Eager to maintain it. So here's what happens. You come to saving faith in Christ and God brings you into his family and he wants you to be a part of his church, right? The, the bride of Christ. And he said, when you're brought in, guess what? Guess what the, the level of unity is? It's 100%. You're eager to maintain it. You're zealous to keep it. That is telling us that we start at full. The only direction it can go is down. So it's not like over time we're building unity together. No. In fact, the opposite is true. Over time, there's more opportunity for us to decrease in our unity. That's why we have to be eager to maintain it. That's why we have to be zealous to guard it and keep it. Because it can't go up anymore, but it surely can go down. And so that's what he's saying. It's not this building up of it. You're to zealously guard against it. So uh, just a practical thing here. Don't contribute to destroying the unity that exists. How do we do that? I got two really fast things that I want to share with you. Number one, and I think this would, I think this would maintain unity above all. If we just practice this one thing, address conflict biblically, it's as if God knew how to do this. I know it's crazy, but you know what the scripture says? If you have something against your brother or sister in Christ, you know what you're supposed to do? I'll give you a hint. It has nothing to do with sharing with anybody other than that person, okay? You're to go to them and to work that conflict out. And that right there would squash most of the disunity that we find in churches, right? It's just being bold enough to actually do what the scriptures say and to go to one another. So that's my challenge. If you've got some offense against somebody here, like I don't want this whole confessional thing to break out. I hope we don't have that much going on here. 
But like, if you need to, to do something there, then the burden is on you. The burden is on the offended. That's how much you're to zealously guard and maintain. Not even waiting for them to go to them and say, listen, I, I have this that's really bothered me. And I want to make sure that we're good. Why? For the sake of Christ. For the sake of Christ. So walk in unity, zealously guard it, address it biblically. And the second little sub point I have there is don't entertain gossip. It's part of the deal too. Like instead of going to that person, what we typically do is we go to everyone else. Then we leave the church. The last person to find out about it, whoever made you mad about something, and usually it's silly. So, so what does he challenge us here? Listen, squash those kind of conversations. Listen, I know this to be true. If you are eager to maintain unity in the church, you will not be the type of person that everybody seeks out to tell about all the things that they don't like. The reverse of that's true as well. If you ever ask yourself, you know what? I wonder why everybody likes coming to me to let me know of all the things that they don't like. If that's true of you, you may have some repenting to do. It may be because you give them a listening ear. But the one that maintains unity, that's zealous to guard it, goes, hey, uh, not going there. And you know what happens when you begin to have those kind of conversations with people who bring you those things? They stop bringing you those things. Why? Because they don't want to hear. But you are zealously guarding the unity in Christ. So that's what we talk about, Christ-like conduct. So those are the two questions I have for you to, to wrap this thing up. Number one, is my conduct Christ-like? Is my conduct Christ-like? And am I walking worthily? Am I walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which I've been called? You know, this week in preparation, I was reading of a church that when they call their elders and their deacons, they take out an ad in a newspaper. And it's this whole idea of being above reproach, right? But they, they go outside of the church walls and they say, hey, listen, anybody in the community, if you got anything on this man, we want you to call the church and let us know. Well, you talk about a level of scrutiny that, that I don't want to be under, right? But that's what we're talking about. Is my conduct Christ-like? If we did the same for you, if we took out an ad in the paper and said, you call us at the church and you let us know if this person is living a lifestyle that's unbecoming of a follower of Jesus, what, what would the report be? Because we may know you in this context, but here, they know you in that context. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. So I want you to ask that question of yourself. Is my conduct Christ-like with my neighbors? With my community at large? With my friends? Some of us, maybe even the question is with my family. Listen, the last thing I ever want is for my kids to not follow the Jesus that their dad follows because I don't actually live this thing out. And sometimes at home, in the, in the safety of those walls, and that's the hardest place to actually live this out. But that's our challenge. Paul is saying, because of all that Christ has done in you and for you, you're called now to live with Christ-like conduct. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. God, we thank you for the challenge that we find in it. God, I pray that this morning that we would lean into whatever you're doing in our hearts and minds right now, God, I pray that if somebody in this room is just kind of feeling uncomfortable about what we talked about, God, I pray that they wouldn't resist that. And I pray that they would ask you what it means. God, I pray that we would have the heart of David. We say, God, search us and know us. Let's see if there's any transgression in us, God. God, I pray that you would shine bright lights on areas of darkness in our life. God, I pray that you would challenge us to actually live out what we say we believe. And God, we know we're not gonna do it perfectly. That's not the, the point. 
But God, we are called to live it out because we've been made new. We've been made alive. So God, I pray over every single person in this room, God, that we would be a church family and a church body that as individuals, we all make a commitment to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've called us. And I pray that you'd be glorified in it. And God, I pray that other people might come to saving faith as a result of our obedience. God, give us opportunities. And I think these opportunities start with our conduct. God, help it to not interfere or cause us to not be able to open our mouths with all boldness and share Jesus because we're afraid of what people might think about us because of the way that we live. So God, encourage us in this, challenge us in this, bring about conviction if, if we need to be convicted of something, God. I pray that you do a mighty work in our hearts and minds. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.